You're listening to Sermon Audio from Grace Mosaic, a congregation of the Grace DC Network in Northeast DC. For more information about our church, visit us online at gracemosaic.org. Early on in the pandemic, I decided I wanted to try my hand at baking. Baking, y'all, baking. Now, y'all know I love to cook. But I'm more of a freestyle kind of cook. You know what I'm saying? Like, I like to add a little art into it and and see how I'm feeling it in the moment and what I might want to sprinkle in there. And you may have heard that baking is more of a precise kind of culinary art, okay? So I I have this pastor friend who, uh, who lives out on the West Coast who always puts up on social media these beautiful loaves of sourdough bread. And so I said, I'm going to make me one of those. So I went and got the ingredients for the sourdough bread. I started doing my thing, mixing it all together. And before long, I had a proofed loaf of sourdough in front of me. And so I decided to score it up real nice. You know, I I made it real pretty, got the little leaves on it. You know, y'all don't know nothing about that. I had them leaves on that thing. And so then I put it in the oven. About an hour later, I pulled that baby out. I let it rest for the time that it needs to rest. And then it was time for the big moment. And so I got the bread knife, and I placed it perfectly in the center of that loaf. And I started to cut and cut (laughs) and cut. And then I finally hollered out through the house, what did y'all do to the bread knife? This joint won't cut for nothing. (laughs) And as usual, Vanessa rolled her eyes at me because ain't nobody in there was messing with the bread knife. I finally hacked off my loaf of bread. And I got some butter and some jelly, and I put that on there, and I took a bite. I almost pulled a muscle in my neck trying to get a bite of that bread. It was so tough. There was no help in this bread. So I wanted to get to the bottom of what was going on, and so I did a little research, and I found out that the reason why my bread was tough is because my starter was bad. In in other words, I was missing an essential ingredient— for this loaf. Now, many of us have some vision of a beautiful community where we can belong, where we can be loved, where we can be valued, and where we can contribute. We might make a decent effort to live in connection with others. We certainly talk a lot about community, but it's often the case that we fail to realize that there is a missing ingredient in a vital, healthy, transformative community, and that missing element is worship. Worship is the missing element. If you don't have healthy, vibrant worship in a community, it's not just tough. It's impossible to be together, to live together as a family. And so today we're going to continue through our series on the household of God, on community, in Romans chapter 12. And and here's the thing. We have talked about worship before. We have talked about community before. But one of the ways that theology works is when you take different biblical and theological concepts and you put them together and there's a new chemistry that brings light to each of them. And so that's what we're going to do here this morning. I want to take worship, which we've talked about, and I want to put that together with its impact, its formative impact, as it relates to community. And our two points for this morning are the worship of God's people and the ethic of God's people. The worship of God's people and the ethic of God's people. So let's look at this first point where we see the worship of God's people. Now, the Apostle Paul has just spent the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans developing the glories of the gospel. He talks about what the gospel does to our past, what it does with our present, and what it provides for our future. What what happens for those who are united to Christ? Your past is covered. You are justified by faith alone. You have righteous standing before the Lord God. But you're also being sanctified. You're being transformed in the present right now by the ministry of the Spirit in community. And your future is glorious. It has not yet appeared what we shall become, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. 
We are given this glorious picture. We are told of the magnificence of the love of God, that we cannot be separated from it. We're told about our adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father, through the Spirit. We're told of the inseparability factor. All of these amazing things are developed for us in light of the gospel. And then Paul gets to chapter 12 and he says, Now, I've laid in the foundations of the gospel that I preach. Now, as a result of that, I want you to present your bodies as a sacrifice. In other words, I'm calling you to worship. And then he presents three qualifiers, right? On that sacrifice. It's not a living sacrifice. It's present your bodies as a sacrifice. What's that sacrifice look like? Living, holy, acceptable to God. That's, that's the way the Greek grammar works, okay? Um, this is the nature of this sacrifice that is supposed to take place. And he says, do not be conformed to the present age. And what's interesting is that language of being conformed, it's a passive verb. In other words, you don't have to be doing anything to be conformed. You get taken along with the flow of the culture. You get brought along with the spirit of the age. He says, don't be conformed to this world. He says, be transformed. It's where we get the word metamorphosis, the butterfly, right? It's to change the fundamental character or condition. Paul is starting this new section of his letter, and he's about to unpack all of the communal implications of the gospel he has announced. But what we must understand, just by reading this chapter, you have to see that before he gets into the communal dynamics, he starts with worship. Why? Because it must. It has to start with worship. In other words, if we're going to get community right, we got to get worship right. And if we don't get worship right, nothing that we try to do will make the community right. That's fundamental in this passage. It's just the flow of the text. That's why I read the whole chapter. It's important for not just taking verses out of context and making the Bible say what you want it to say. You know, because a lot of us, we approach the Bible and we have this idea of what we think it should say. And then we try to make it thus. But we are supposed to hear from the word and trust in the wisdom of God for the beautification of our lives and our community. And what we see here is that worship is how Paul tees up everything that is to take place in the community. Our deepest, most root level issues are not psychological, they're not social, and they're not emotional. They are liturgical and doxological, which is to say they are about worship. Those are our fundamental issues. And then our worship issues then exacerbate or heal our social issues our emotional issues. They contribute to either our healing or our prolonged dysfunction. Our root issues have everything to do with what or who we are worshiping, glorifying, or giving our loyalties to. You know, worship can sometimes sound like an overly religious word. But you think about loyalty, right? Kendrick Lamar raps about loyalty, right? Come on, Ashley, that was for you. Loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. Yo, yo, I'm still hip, all right? I'm still hip. I know what's good out there. All right? That Kendrick Lamar. You know what I'm saying? All right. <laughs> Our culture has different language, but it's desire. It's, it's my, my vision, my dream, my passions. It's like this is the language of worship. This is one of the most formative realities for our life together. What is the state of our worship? Because Paul knows that our worship is unceasing and central to our lives. And the only thing that varies is the object of our worship. We've said this a hundred times in here, okay? But again, we're trying to put this together with community, kind of a new chemistry, okay? Take the form of Sunday morning, right? Like you look at your worship guide. Take the form of our worship. We don't just like throw this together because it's like, oh, that seems like a decent order. It's very thoughtfully put together. Pastor Joel puts in that work and and trying to make sure that our order of worship, our liturgy, actually reflects the nature of our faith. But you can take this same form, start with a call to worship, and you move on to singing, worship, and praise. Then you get to confession. Then you get to pardon. 
then you get to to prayer and preaching, and you get to the table, you get to the benediction, right? Take that form and really work it out to understand the ways in which our worship often gets askew. So I want to take one example. You can plug anything in like this, but I want to lay it out so that it's clear, okay? Think about it. What is it like when you hear the call to worship from success? Because you've got to understand that every day, all day, you are hearing competing calls to worship. All day, every day, you are being invited to worship. What happens when success issues you a call to worship and you heed that call to worship? Well, you're invited to worship success. And when you embrace the call to worship success, then you begin to sing the praises of success and successful people. You sing of how central success is to all of life. You exalt success. You serve success. You seek to bend your will and your ways to the dictates of success. When you encounter failure, you are cut to the heart. And you repent of your unsuccessful ways and rededicate yourself to success. You listen to sermons on success in the form of social media messages. These sermons proclaim the good news of success, why you should give your heart to success, make sacrifices for success, and how success can give you a new kind of life. You seek salvation from success, trusting in the power of success to save you from the ultimate hell of failure and insignificance. You engage the sacraments of success, education, and networking, hoping to be strengthened to gain still more success. And then you seek the benediction of success. May success bless you and keep you. May success shine its face upon you and be gracious to you. May success give you peace. That's what it really looks like to worship success. And again, you can plug anything in there. You can plug money in there. You can plug a political ideology in there. You can use anything and put it in there, but it shows you what idolatrous worship looks like. I've done this before, but you can even... T- Sometimes we fail to see how egregious it is when we, when we worship idols. You know, like, it, it seems crazy, but like, you know, you just take a standard worship song. You know, and you say, here I am to worship money. Here I am to bow down to the dollar. Here I am to say it. it, it that makes it seem more heinous. But that's exactly what's happening on the inside when there's idolatry at work in our worship. We've named the idolatrous wor- worship of success. And it has devastating results for community because it forms us to be autonomous Selfish and individualistic. And here's, here's the secret. Every idol has its own peculiar devastating impact on community when we worship it. And that is one of the reasons why Paul starts off this section before he gets to the way that he envisions the community living together. He, he starts with the gospel, then he gets to worship. Now he's like, now we're ready to talk about community. Let's get the worship sorted out. Paul is combating every other call to worship, every idol, every overinflated love of our hearts by appealing to the mercies of God in Christ. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said this, and I quote, The gods we worship write their names on our faces. Be sure of that. And a man will worship something. That which dominates his will determines his life and character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship. For what we are worshiping, we are becoming. Ralph Waldo Emerson, that theologian and poet laureate. The gods we worship write their names on our faces. Paul would say that the name written on our face should be the name that's above every name. He would say that the name to be written on our faces 
is the one who has written your name in the palm of his hand. The name that's to be written on our faces is the one who has written our names in the Lamb's book of life, who has, who has written canceled over all of our sins, who has fulfilled all that has been written. He alone is worthy of our worship. You will either become spiritually ugly, lifeless, and empty like the idols you worship, or you will become spiritually beautiful and full of life like Jesus Christ. We are all being made into the image and likeness of the things we worship and revere. And all of this bears repeating again and again because we are often determined to reduce the Christian life to the mastery of ideas when it's really a holistic, embodied, liturgical reformation of our habits and our practices. So, so, so what I'm saying is, it's not like, oh, I just got the right ideas about worship and now I'm good. No, 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 no. That's the beginning of a complete rehabituation of your life. To put it clearly, the establishment of new practices and new habits is going to tell the story of your worship. Do not be fooled into thinking that your, your love for the Lord is genuine if your practices do not demonstrate that. It's simply about being honest with yourself. We all need a rehabituation. We need a reformation of our practices. And it can be simultaneously frustrating and freeing at the same time. Why could it be frustrating? Because you're smart. You're, you're, you're brilliant people. Uh, and it feels beneath you to do something so simple as to change up your habits, to change your practices, to stop looking at your phone past 8 p.m. Like, you know, like to go to bed at an appropriate hour and to wake up early enough to be able to commune with the Lord and treat your family right. You know, like, it, like, it, it seems, seems so simple. It's like, no, nah, it's got to be harder than that. I need a challenge, right? I'm smart. <laughs> You are smart. But God has given us a very simple and accessible thing to do here. It's a rehabituation. You need new habits. If you, it, it, the way you are changed is not just from the inside out, where you get the, the gospel gets in and you just automatically change. It's a half-truth, right? I say this all the time. It's a dumb illustration, but it gets the point across. How do you breathe? Through inhaling or exhaling. It's both. The gospel has to get in. You are formed from the inside out, and you are also formed from the outside in. Your practices that you take up, they shape you. They form you. And what I'm trying to say is that this, this connection between worship and community, it's not, like, it's not like mastering music theory. It's like learning to play scales. You get it in your hands. Now, now this, is a, this is a tender point for me. I lost a lot of money going to NYU to study music. <laughs> Vanessa got piano lessons from her aunt and uncle, who they got their master's in piano performance at Catholic University. It's in her. Like, she'll just sit down and play Chopin. When I tell y'all <laughs> how mad it makes me, she don't even practice anymore. She don't even do it. I studied music theory. Kicked me up one side and down the other, right? Like... I know some music, I knew some new music theory, but Vanessa had it in her. And that's the difference. How do we become this beautiful community that we want to become? I keep borrowing the title of that blessed book by the Reverend Dr. Erwin Entz. How do we become that beautiful community? Read that book and buy it too, right? Uh, but also, we need to attend to our practices. In other words, we need to get community in us like this. We, we, we already got a lot of good ideas in. Y'all are intelligent people. Some of y'all get bored like, through large portions of my sermon because you're like, I heard him say that already. When's he going to get some new material? 
I ain't got but one sermon, really. Like, Jesus is Lord. He can change your life, right? Like, in, a, in as many iterations as the Lord gives me years to, to tell that story, right? We got the ideas in, but, like, really, the challenge of maturity is practices. And it's so beautiful because you don't have to have no fancy degree. You don't have to, you don't have, to have any education in this world. You don't have to have any particular amount of money in this world. I look at my grandparents, like they, they, they didn't go beyond a, a, a junior high education. And I'm going to tell you something. They were some praying folk. They were faithful to serve the church. And they, they were just deeply self-sacrificial. Like they didn't need all the fancy learning to be godly people to, and to live in love with their community. <laughs> it was amazing watching my grandfather clean all these fish that I caught and my dad couldn't catch. Um, <laughs> I'm going to tell him to watch this sermon just for that right here. Um, to watch him clean in the fish so that he could do the fish fry. Just so he could sit back and watch everyone enjoy it. Like, that, this is simple stuff. Rehabituation. We have to get out of this idea that the Christian life is about mastery of ideas. So you need to teach me more, teach me more, teach me more. I want you to live a greater percentage of the things you already know. That's accessible, right? That's accessible. All right. But what actually happens when you worship the God who is one in three and three in one? Father, Son, Spirit. What happens when you worship the God who is divine community? You are formed in communal instincts. You are formed to live in community. Second point, the ethic of God's people. What we can gather from Paul here is that rightly ordered worship is essential for rightly related community. And here's the flow. After calling the church to worship in verses 1 through 2, if you look at the text, Paul calls us to sober self-assessment. He says, don't lift yourself up, but don't beat yourself up. Sober self-assessment. And then in verse 3, he tells us that we are members of one another and that God has distributed gifts to each of us for the benefit of our community. And when each of us maintains a sober self-assessment, when each of us faithfully uses our gifts, we fit together. He then spells out some of the dynamics of our life together and the significance of that life together for our relationship to the world. You see how it flows? He starts with shared worship. Then he goes to shared gifts. Then he goes to uh, a shared ethic. And then he goes to a shared mission. It doesn't seem like he goes to a shared mission because all of it's about being persecuted and being beat up on in the world. But make no mistake, bearing witness to Christ under excruciating circumstances is mission. All right? This This is the flow of it. We arrive at this shared ethic in verses 9 through 10. Take a look. He says, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly love, outdo one another in showing honor. You see the flow that Paul is is developing? We all want to, we want to be more loving and we all want to be part of a more genuinely loving community that isn't merely performative. That's what we all want deep down. We all want to be honored. We all want to have our dignity and our value recognized. But Paul is telling us that the way to this genuine love, to, the, 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 to mutual honor, is through right worship. And the reason why is that right worship involves the reordering of our loves. That's why. Worship is all about what you might call the taxis of your loves. You love your job. You love a spouse if you have a spouse. You love your family. You love your children. You might love chocolate cake, right? Like... I love chocolate cake. I love God. Now, if I love chocolate cake more than I love God, my love is disordered. I'm talking, I'm I'm borrowing from Augustine, the African church father, Augustine. It's all about the ordering of your love. So, So what we have to think about is the way that our habits tell the truth about the ordering of our love. How does my habits... How do my habits speak to the ordering of my loves and what I love most? Does it it communicate that my love is disordered because 
work is higher up on my love list than the Lord or my community? How do we, how do we actually work this out? This is, this is what worship does. Or, worship is the reordering of our loves. It's not saying, Augustine isn't saying, don't love chocolate cake. Because chocolate cake is from God. <laughs> it's not saying, don't love work. I, I hope that all of you get to do work that you love. It's about the ordering of your loves and how you have to tend to your soul in terms of the taxes of your love. And this is the problem Just as a sidebar, this is the problem with the love is love mantra. It assumes that our loves are already proportionate and rightly ordered. That's a problem. This way of thinking about love amounts to little more than a do whatever you feel or desire separate from any moral framework. However, this sentiment conflicts with what we know to be true about our desires and our longings. That we are selfish. That we are often not perfect, right? Everyone is quick to say nobody's perfect. Well, look, that's true of your loves as well. In short, we fail to take into account that we're sinners. And that, that's, that's the breakdown there. There is, there is a doctrine of love in our public discourse. What I'm trying to give you is a more robust resource for thinking about love and worship and what that means for our community. The good news of the gospel is that <laughs> Look, let me just say this. Let me say this. For all of our talk about love in this culture, we proved that we wouldn't know love if he was staring us in the face. Because we saw the one who is love, God, in the flesh. And what do we do? We opposed him. We rejected him. We betrayed him. We ran from him. We crucified him. And we buried him. That's the bad news about us. We don't know nothing about love. The good news about God is that love got up from the grave. That's the good news that the Lord Jesus rose up from the grave and he's bringing us with him. He has raised us up with him so that we will be the kind of people that loves like he loves, loves in community. The good news, if you go back to verse 1, I want to train your eyes to always look at the text and to see the centrality of Jesus in the good news of the gospel. You know what the good news of the gospel is? If you go back to verse 1, you can see the good news that Jesus is the true worship leader who can transform the self-absorbed into lovers. He's not just our perfect example of worship and love to God the Father, We are saved because of the faithful worship of Christ. If Jesus had had one idolatrous moment in his life, we would be lost forever. But he presented his body a sacrifice, living, holy, acceptable to God, so that we could do the same and return our love to him and love our community. We have been saved by his true worship and his rightly ordered love. (laughs) <laughs> it's amazing. This should lift our estimate of Jesus. And the promise of this text is that if we turn our hearts to the Lord and worship, we will enjoy a shared ethic of love in our community that results in a shared mission and bearing witness. And how does this worship, this reordering of our loves, begin to take shape in our lives? Two brief points. T- two brief ways, I'll just say. By attending to the ordinary means of grace and the ordinary moments of life. Attending to the ordinary means of grace and the ordinary moments of life. It begins with attending to the ordinary means of grace. In this church, we talk about the ordinary means of grace, which means you don't have to go to a fancy Christian concert or you don't have to go and uh, go to some conference in order to have some fantastic mountaintop experience in order to have an encounter with God. How do you encounter God? The word, the sacraments, prayer. It's that simple. If you want to get hit by a car, go play in the street. You want to get hit by a train, go play on the train tracks. You want to get hit by God's grace? Word, sacraments, prayer. It's that simple. Accessible, right? I know that our American Christian context 
leads us to believe that we need something more exciting, though, right? But here's, here's the deal. As I watch my little Lorenzo and Carissa run out to our little garden every day, expecting that some vegetables have just, like, burst out overnight, <laughs> one of the things that I've been trying to teach them is that plants grow slowly, but surely over time, when they get the right kind of nourishment, the right amount of water, the right amount of sunshine, the right kind of pruning, and the right kind of care. And so does every Christian. Okay? This is how we grow. The right kind of nourishment, the bread of life, the word. The right amount of water, the living water, communion with Christ, right? The right amount of sunshine. That's why we give the benediction. May God's face shine upon you. You need the right kind of sunshine. The right kind of pruning, God's fatherly discipline. And the right kind of care, the Lord's shepherding through his church, not apart from it. Okay? There are many things you can do by yourself, but being a Christian is not one of them. That's what the text says. The ordinary means of grace give us all that we need for life and godliness and flourishing as a community. But also, attend to the ordinary moments of life. How you live in the ordinary moments tells you a lot about your worship and your loves. And how we live in the ordinary moments will show up in our community. Either deepening our love and our care and our service or deepening our distance from one another and division an unhealthy conflict. If we, I mean, think about it. If we turn to the Lord as quickly and as often as we turn to our cell phones, we would be spiritual giants. I, that, I, look, look. You see, I got a little singe on my hair because when that hit me, because I do the same thing. What do you do in moments of boredom? Turn my heart to the Lord. No. Candy crush, candy crush. Uh, 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 uh. Right, right. <laughs> or some, some, checking your email, getting frustrated, right? Like, if we turn to our phones, if we turn to the face of the Lord as often, like, again, remember, it's simple. It's habits. It's practices. If we started our days in prayer and carried out our days with a recognition of the Lord's presence with us and ended our days in prayer, our life together would be all the more unified and beautified. Fact. If we practiced being present and cultivating a sense of wonder at the Lord and all of his surrounding gifts, we would be such a joyful people, a buoyancy in our joy, so hesitant to complain and to gripe and to commiserate. We wouldn't be so cranky, ready to light people up. There's no end to the creative possibilities when you attend to the ordinary moments. Be present to the Lord as he's present to you. Awareness can really mark our community. If you don't know what to pray, I mean, we didn't even coordinate this, but Pastor Irwin did it this morning. Pray the scriptures into your life. Some people are like, oh man, I don't know, I've run out of things to say. Look, just pray the text into your life. Lord, help me to recognize your mercies and to present my my body as a as a sacrifice. Lord, Lord, I know this is my spiritual worship. Would you forgive me for the times that I have just taken the easy, comfortable course and have worshiped other things? Like you can camp out in the scriptures and just pray the scriptures. Help me not to be conformed to this world. I'm feeling it, Lord, like I want to be conformed to the world on this particular issue. Would you help me to be transformed? To have a renewed mind and, a, and, and renewed practices. Lord, would you, would you do that in my life? Pray it into our community. You don't like what our community is? Pray the scriptures into our community. You don't like what I'm up, about, I'm up to? You don't like my preaching? Do you pray for me? Ain't nobody need more prayer than me. Fact. <laughs> this is not an easy thing to do, right? Like, it's not a difficult thing, but these are the small, ordinary things that we can do in the ordinary moments to be a different kind of community. If we would be the kind of community that our hearts are really longing for, that our neighbors are deep down longing for, it must begin with habitually directing our love and affection to the Lord. So let's pray that he would help us, and let's do the next best and good thing. Amen. Thanks for the
listen to this podcast from Grace Mosaic. For more information about our church, visit us online at gracemosaic.org.